Hey y'all, welcome to the channel. Today we're checking out the British-American War of 1812, explained in 13 minutes. In 1812, the young nation of the United States took on the country with the most powerful navy in the world in a war that would affect more than just the former colonies and their colonizer. The United States of America first gained freedom from the British in an eight-year-long revolutionary war that finally came to a close when Britain inevitably recognized the independence of their 13 former colonies on September 3rd, 1783. That one strip of the East Coast. Not even Florida. I think Florida was Spanish at the time, wasn't it? Maybe not. One of the most relevant impacts of this war that would fuel future tensions between the U.S. and Britain once again was the role of the Native Americans. During the revolution, the Native Americans mostly supported the Brits, who they hoped would continue to restrict expansion from the U.S. settlers into Native American territory. That makes sense, when yeah. Britain failed to maintain its rule over the colonies, the United States eventually accelerated its takeover of native land, causing even more friction between the American societies. This friction only grew stronger as the years went on, as Britain remained a driving force of the discord since not only had the natives taken its side in the revolution, but the British also openly encouraged the Native Americans to fight back against their antagonists. By 1812, this, combined with a few other factors, led to the development of a new war. That's interesting because you wouldn't think that the natives would be supporting the British. While the United States was clearly unhappy with the united opposition from Britain and the natives, they were also infuriated by allegations that the Royal Navy was utilizing a tactic known as impressment to take U.S. men for their own troops. On top of this, the ongoing strife between Britain and France had a no- on. Don't skate over that. What's impressment? The impressment forcible seizure of American seamen by the British Royal Navy in the late 18th and early 19th centuries had traditionally been viewed as a primary cause of the War of 1812. So they were kidnapping people? Impressment constituted a long-standing maritime tradition in Great Britain, a prerogative held by the Crown following centuries of development. As Britain evolved into a strong seafaring nation, the Royal Navy gradually viewed impressment as a legitimate method of recruitment. So they were just kidnapping people and forcing them to be in the Navy. Impressment is a much nicer word than kidnapping. Impressment. Enjoy your impressment. The ongoing strife between Britain and France had a notable impact on the United States. Heavily locked in their own struggle, the warring nations tried to restrict trade from neutral countries and punish anyone who attempted to ignore the constraints. This put the United States in a detrimental position due to their inability to continue trade with either nation unless they wanted to risk invoking the wrath of the other side. While mm. France took a more laid-back approach to ensure the U.S. abstained from doing business with the British, the latter was more aggressive about the matter. On January 7th, 1807, Britain issued an order in council, stating, It is hereby ordered that no vessel shall be permitted to trade from one port to another, both which ports shall belong to or be in the possession of France or her allies, or shall be so far under their control as the British vessels may not freely trade. Furthermore, any ships that refuse to obey these restrictions would be subject to seizure by the Royal Navy, cargo and all. By November, the original order was expanded, now to include all the ports and places of France and her allies, or of any other country at war with His Majesty, and all other ports or places in Europe, from which, although not at war with His Majesty, the British flag is excluded, and all ports or places in the colonies belonging to His Majesty's enemies. In retaliation, what? France, under the command of Napoleon Bonaparte, issued the Milan Decree, which said that every ship to whatever nation it may belong that shall have submitted to be searched by an English ship or to a voyage to England or shall have paid any tax whatsoever to the English government is thereby and for that alone declared to be denationalized, to have forfeited the protection of its king and to have become English property. Adding on, Napoleon 
declared that any of the aforementioned ships that enter French ports or those of French allies are good and lawful prizes of his nation. Okay, so first England said, you can't trade with France. Then France said, you can't trade with England. Is that what I'm getting out of all this legalese? It is hereby ordered that no vessel shall be permitted to trade from one port okay. supplies yeah. or a force to reply. U.S. President Thomas Jefferson signed the Embargo Act in December of 1807, blocking all international trade from American ports and taking direct aim at Britain. Unfortunately for America, the act backfired and turned the U.S. into more of a victim than anyone else. So Thomas Jefferson said no trading with any other countries? So, okay, so Britain said you can only trade with Britain. France said you can only trade with France. And America said, screw you both. We're not trading with either of you. <laughs> but it sounds like it backfired. Emphasizing this point, the minister to France himself even said, here it is not felt, and in England it is forgotten. The effects of the Embargo Act ultimately pushed the US into an economic depression, and it had to be repealed less than two years after the initial signature. It seems like a predictable consequence of not trading with any other country, right? In its place, the Non-Intercourse Act was passed, which directly forbade trade with Britain and oh. France and their colonies. When this new act still proved to be ineffective, the United States tried once again, this time passing Macon's Bill Number 2 in May of 1810. Okay, so wait. First Thomas Jefferson enacted an embargo. Two years later, it was repealed and replaced with another embargo even said here it is not felt and in england it is forgotten okay so france and england both said we're not paying attention to you thomas jefferson we're still doing what we want to do macon's bill number two in may of 1810 this bill lifted trading bans and stated that if either france or britain removed their own restrictions the u.s would re-establish an embargo with the opposing nation so the united states said Hey, France, if you lift your restrictions, we will stop trading with Britain. Hey, Britain, if you lift your restrictions with us, we'll stop trading with France. What a mess. By August, Napoleon enacted a plan to exacerbate tension between Britain and the United States, and it ultimately worked. He first told the new president, James Madison, that he intended to exempt the U.S. from his previously established Berlin and Milan decrees, promoting Madison to bring back the Non-Intercourse Act constraints against Britain in November of that year, despite the fact that Napoleon never actually followed through on his proclamation. Wait. Gotta hear that Bring again. back its allies were to be arrested as prisoners of war and all British goods or merchandise seized. So Napoleon basically said, if you trade with Britain, you're our enemy. All correspondence or commerce. And if they find any British people in French territory, they are arresting them and taking all their stuff. Okay. That sounds like Napoleon. Despite the fact that Napoleon never actually followed through on his proclamation, Britain and the United States were now on the brink of all-out war. Okay, so when the United States said, hey, if either of you drop your restrictions, we will impose an embargo on the other, France said, hey, we'll lift our restrictions. So the United States said, okay, we're gonna not trade with Britain anymore. And I guess that's what's leading to this war. Napoleon, well, uh, I, I know he was around at that time, and I know he was a big deal, and he was causing a bunch of trouble over in Europe, but I always forget that he had something to do with the United States in the early years. We're now on the brink of all-out war. The go. final straw came when the Battle of Tippecanoe unfolded in late 1811, as the U.S. troops claimed victory over the Native Americans, wishing to stop further expansion once again. Given the United States was fairly confident in the belief that the British were supplying the natives with weapons from Canada, a faction of the U.S. Republican Party known as the Warhawks began a heavy push towards an official declaration of war. At last, on June 18, 1812, President James 
James Madison signed the Declaration against Britain, despite contention about the issue coming from both the House and Senate. Another problem emerged as well when Britain decided to suddenly repeal their trade restrictions before news of the US declaration of war actually reached the British over a month later. Oh, okay. So Madison declared war while the Congress and the Senate didn't want to go to war. And then because of the times and it took so long for the messages to get around the world, the English lifted their trade restrictions before the message of America's declaring war on them reached Britain. Aware of this delay, Britain decided not to immediately respond to the call of war and waited to see how the Americans would react to their Smart. appeals. When the US got wind of this surprising development, they were, in turn, unsure of how the Brits would react to their declaration of war. Ultimately, the United States decided to follow through on its proclamation and did so by invading Canada, which was a British colony at the time. What? While the I didn't know we invaded Canada. What a strange, fun fact. Invading Canada, which was a British colony at the time. While the American troops hoped to capture Canadian land to force Britain into negotiation, they had no such success. No one was prepared for war. The British and French had been busy fighting their own battles, and the US military was grossly ill-suited to take on the likes of Britain. The defeats were plenty and humiliating for the Americans. Mm -hmm. One excessively humbling loss for the US happened when General Will William Hull surrendered Fort Detroit on August 16, 1812, and his own army to the British troops, and allowed Michigan territory to be deemed as part of Britain. Wow, weird to hear Detroit existing in the early 1800s. But Detroit was lost to the English during the War of 1812, or surrendered to the English. That's nuts. What a weird thing to think about. Chased across the Canadian border, as Hull saw the size of his opponent's forces, which was a mix of British and Native American troops, and knowing that his daughter and grandchild were in the fort, he decided to give up without a single shot being fired. Sometimes you shouldn't take your children to work, including during a war without a single shot being fired. Hull's disgraceful failure led to an uptick in Native American raids in the Northwest and British conflict under the command of Major General Henry Proctor. Adding insult to injury, U.S. Brigadier General Henry Dearborn struggled to make any progress on the Northeastern border because the militias in New England were not supportive of the war and uninterested in coming together for an attack on Montreal. Really? By October, so the Americans in the Northeast were just refusing to fight. Wow. And uninterested in coming together for an attack on Montreal. By October, the Americans were finally able to get some momentum as Major General Stephen von Rensselaer led an army of 3,100 militiamen into the Battle of Queenston Heights. Rensselaer sent some advanced units across the river where they were able to hold their ground for some time on a slope just above Queenston and were successful until they were overcome by British forces as the rest of the American troops refused to join the fight. 925 U.S. soldiers were then captured by the British, despite Major General Isaac Brock on the British side being killed during the battle. Yet again, the Americans took another hit in 1813, when an attempt to retake Detroit resulted in a massacre of U.S. prisoners by their Native American opponents. On top of that, Brigadier General Henry Dearborn was replaced by Major General James Wilkins, at long last, though, in September of 1813, U.S. Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry scored a major naval victory at Lake Erie against the forces of British Captain Robert Barclay and opened the gates for more success on the American side. When the Battle of the Thames erupted the following month, the U.S. finally defeated the British and Native American allied forces. The next spring season, the oh. Battle of Horseshoe Bend, a U.S. militia force faced off with a Native American force known as the Red Sticks and found victory 
once again, demanding that the losing side cede roughly 23 million acres of land, which would later become Alabama and span partially into Georgia. Another win for the United States followed wow. in the summer, July of 1814, at the Battle of Chippewa, but it was short-lived, as the Battle of Lundy's Lane ended in a bloody stalemate shortly after, forcing the Americans to withdraw. The real deciding factor in the war came when Napoleon faced his first exile, allowing Britain to shift more focus to the discord with the United States. The British sliced uh. through the US, destroying government buildings, including the White House, as they took control of Washington, D.C. Yeah, the main thing that I always hear about the War of 1812 is that the British set fire to the White House, and I guess James Madison's wife saved a bunch of artwork from the White House. So it sounds like at this point, Napoleon lost his power, and so Britain was able to take some of those forces they were using to fight Napoleon and put them towards fighting the Americans. The Brits then tried to push farther into Baltimore by September under the authority of General Robert Ross, but were repulsed at the Battle of North Point where General Ross was killed. Baltimore is a tough town. In the battle that inspired the U.S. National Anthem, more British troops were fought off at Fort McHenry. As these conflicts raged on, peace talks began in Ghent and eventually resulted in a signed treaty on December 24, 1814. Still, just as with the declaration of war, the news was delayed and took until February 18, 1815 to officially be ratified and wow. end the war. Two the months. Treaty of Ghent reverted things back mostly to how they were before the combat with a status quo antebellum. All territory was returned. Britain repealed their trade restrictions, stopped supporting the Native American revolts, and ended their impressment strategies. In the end, Good. the war was essentially a draw, and the only real losing side was the Native Americans, of course. who had high hopes for British help in stopping U.S. expansion. Britain was able to claim victory against the French, and in a way, against the U.S. Meanwhile, the U.S. had the pride <laughs> of more or less winning their second war of independence. Yeah, it is always crazy whenever you hear about the Revolutionary War. The War of 1812 is often left out of that, but it's it's sort of like Revolutionary War Part 2. Great video. Thank y'all for recommending. Thank y'all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Later.